everyone, every, everybody. So, uh, oh, see, welcome. Uh, hi, Sally. So, um, so we're ready to start. Uh, well, um, welcome to everybody to the last session and uh, of uh, our event. I would like to thank you for attending. Uh, and uh, this time we're gonna address uh, consumer insights, uh, like see uh, what we actually like, or I mean, what we as consumers uh, would want. Um, uh, but first, we're gonna have uh, two little presentations from our sponsors. Uh, Tina from uh, Vintech will uh, do a little uh, presentation first and present and say hi to everyone. Um, and then uh, Alicia, and then finally Amy will be uh, uh, um, uh, talking to us about uh, her discoveries. Um, thank you. All right, so I work for Vintech Canada. We are the largest producer and importer in Canada of grapevines. And so, um, and, and we supply the largest supplier of grapevines. Our Canadian grafted vines are produced using a combination of Canadian source and tested cyan wood grafted onto French rootstock, which is certified by Fritz Agamer and by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Our tested material is unique to in that it is traceable back to its source mother blocks, which means it's authentic to the name and clone. Our Canadian cyan material testing protocols meet or exceed current industry standards. The rootstock we use is fully tested and certified in France by the government testing agency France Agrimer, approved and audited by the CFA in Canada. It is the cleanest rootstock available in the Canadian industry and the only rootstock that is guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be red blotch free. And that would be because they do not currently have red blotch in France. Um, our Euro European imported vines are 100% certified vines sourced directly from the CFA approved sources in Europe. Like the rootstock, the vines are fully tested and certified by European government testing agencies approved and audited by the CFA in Canada. These are the cleanest vines available to the Canadian industry and also the only vines that are going to be guaranteed to be free of red blotch. We're working diligently in our own clean vine and vine cert certification to ensure that we're able to supply the cleanest material to the Canadian industry with guaranteed authenticity, as well as new clones better geared to our Canadian industry. Um, there are hybrids included in this clean plant program as well, so including Minnesota varieties, Vidal, Bacanoa, and the much awaited Atasca. Um, these vines are available in limited quantities right now. Uh, we're sold out for 2021, but uh, I will be putting some 2022 inventory availability on our website in the next little while. Our current grapevine availability is updated on our website. So if anyone is still looking for grapevines, uh, we do update it regularly on our website. Um, so you can take a look at what the options are. Um, the 2022 list is posted there as well now. Uh, there is, there might still be more options for 2022 that we can both get out of France and the USA, but obviously most nurseries at this point will have already produced or will be in the process of grafting like we are our 2022 crop. Um, so obviously we're changing what we graft is at this point probably too late. Um, we offer trellising material as well. If you need trellising material, we have to include grippa products, wire, T-posts, end posts, anchors, galvanized, profiled, all size clipless posts. Um, and if so, if, if, if you're in need of any of those things, uh, send me an email and I'll connect you with Brian Morgan, who would be our trellising material expert. Also, if um, anybody is looking for planting services, GPS machine planting services in the spring, send me an email so that I can make sure the planting crew has your name to know to contact you for, for planting services in the county or in the surrounding area. We also are planting a lot actually in Quebec this year and then locally and, and um, some destination plantings. There's, there's quite a bit. So, so if, if you do need it, there is a minimum uh, in the county we tend to do everybody at the same time so that 
everybody as a group, it works better to do small quantities, but if we're doing a long distance trip, there is a minimum buying requirement of 2000 bytes. It's a, it has to, be, has to be justified to drive a tractor and an entire crew to a field. So, all right, so that's like good. Um, thank you, Tina. Uh, does anybody have a question for Tina before uh, Alicia's presentation? Uh, just raise your hand or, I mean, just uh, unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you, Tina, for, for, for saying hi to everyone. Uh, so, Alicia, please take it away. You guys can see my screen okay? Yeah, perfect, yes. Um, it's in full screen mode. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Okay, um, okay. I just, uh, so my name, if for anyone who was on the call uh, or on the spring tune-up session yesterday um, that was sponsored by Bartlett's or, or run by Corey Bartlett, um, I did go through all of our great products on that call. Um, I just thought I would introduce myself again and sort of give you guys some information, um, numbers to call websites or uh, information if you need to reach out to anyone in New Farm um, during the season, if you have any questions. So um, I thought I would put this back up. New Farm is a crop protection company. Sorry for anyone who wasn't um, on the call yesterday. So we have uh, several different products in uh, many different crops, but this is our, grow our grape growth stage calendar. So um, the top line, you'll see is Chateau is our herbicide product. It is a um, post-emerge, uh, or sorry, a uh, residual product for broadleaves. Um, it's applied dormant at dormant time or post-harvest usually because um, if you're not using a hooded or shielded boom, it can or it will burn any green tissue it comes in contact with. And it needs to be um, applied to vines that are at least two years old. The next line is our fungicides. Um, so Intuity is a uh, group 11 botrytocide um, and, and Parasol WG is a um, copper product. So I know Wendy talked about copper products earlier this morning. There are several different copper products on the market. Uh, Parasol WG is a copper hydroxide. It just recently got registered on grapes uh, two years ago, I think it was. Um, like Duarte was saying, it's hard to remember how long ago things happened. Um, but uh, I believe it was two years ago, we got Parasol WG registered in grapes. Um, it's registered for several uh, several different crops, but mainly um, it would I would say it's a good downy mildew product uh, and it's a, a protective product. So what's nice about Intuity is, or sorry, about Parasol WG is it is um, Pro -cert certified. So it is registered for organic use. Um, and then the last line there is two insecticides. And these are also um, organic registered products. They're registered through Omri. And they're both BT products. So um, Bacillus thuringiensis products, and they control uh, Lepidoptera. So they're not a they are not a broad spectrum um, insecticide because um, because they are only controlling the Lepidoptera species. So that's a quick overview of our uh, of our great products. And then just mm -hmm. for the last slide, I thought I'd put on here for you guys. Um, the 1-800 number is a number on, that is listed on the website. It's listed on the horticulture guides. It's also listed, I think, on every single case of product. Um, the 1-800 line is a great line to call um, if you don't have my phone number. <laughs> um, they are based in uh, the prairies, so they take calls for all of New Farm products um, from row crop to um, western the Western crops and uh, also horticulture. So often, uh, and they're very knowledgeable, but they often will um, contact me on any questions that they don't know the answer to. Um, so I am the horticulture rep for New Farm for all of Canada. Um, I should have said that at the beginning, I've been with them for about three years now. 
Um, and uh, so I cover all of our fruits and vegetable products and, and often the um, two people that run the 1-800 line will refer you to, uh, to give me a call anyways, or for me to reach back out to you. Um, I do have our website on here as well for anyone. Um, this That link will take you directly to um, the horticulture side. And uh, I put just two snaps of, I have loaded these two PDFs into um, the, I guess it's like under the sponsor section um, in the, on the WOBA for this um, trade show website. So I loaded the grapes one and this condenses the guide to just the grape products um, for you to more easily go through. And I also attached the complete horticulture guide on there. So this is, that guide will have all of our um, fruit and vegetable products that we have registered. On the website, you'll also see uh, we do the same like we do for grapes for other crops like um, we have all vegetable specific one, we have an apple specific one, we have a blueberry specific one, and potato would be the last one. Um, so uh, yeah, I just thought I'd give you guys a bit of a background um, and some of the information that is available to you through this website and through the app right now. Um, but also if you go to the New Firm um, website, there is there is some more information if you need it. So. Uh, that concludes nine. And if anyone was on the call yesterday, I know that um, Pat Johnson had made a comment wondering why he was last um, to do the presentations. And so I think it's important just to know that they always save the best presentations for the last. Take care, guys. Yes, yes thank you, Elisa. Yeah, no uh, uh, yes, thank you for this presentation. And uh, does anybody have a question for Elisa or I mean she she did put her uh, contact information so as I said um, last but not least uh, we're happy to have uh, Amy Bowen here from uh, Vineland uh, Research Center and so she's going to give us um, uh, an overview of her findings regarding uh, uh, what people really want to drink uh, in terms of wine of course because we're in a um wine conference so please um uh, amy uh bowen please uh take it from here <laughs> yes okay so yes so let so me i'll share my here. screen here Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Uh, can you okay. uh, explain it to a slideshow? That would be nice. It's not on a slideshow? Uh, it's just, um, you can still see the PowerPoint. Yeah, it hasn't gone full screen yet. Uh, yes. Oh, okay, let me stop sharing. And I think it. Well, you might take a little bit of time, but if you. It's full screen on mine, so give me a second. Okay, so here. Maybe delay yeah sometimes there's a delay so yeah yeah sometimes you have to press the swap um screens i only have one screen that's the thing well give it a try and okay. we can wait a, like a few seconds it might take a little bit of time sometimes there's a delay so if i share this and then if i go Oh, you know what I think I have to do? I have to share the whole app as opposed to the window. Let me try it a different way. So if, oh, no. Okay, you can see that. Yes. So if you go to your, um, just on the PowerPoint on the bottom, uh, I don't know if you can go, yeah, there, yeah, that one. Yeah, uh, yeah so it's full screen on mine now, is it on yours? Not, not yet, maybe it just takes a little bit of time, but, uh, hmm. We, we can see it either way, so. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all right, yeah, I just, um, yeah. Please go ahead if uh, 
it, it might just come up in a bit. Is that better? No. We're good. But can you see it full screen now? No, it still looks the same. It yeah. Looks the but, same. Uh, yeah. Okay. And okay, well, maybe I'll just minimize the sidebar there. How's that? Well, that won't work though, will it? No, we lost the shared screen. Oh, oh okay. so there, there you go. That. That's better. Yep. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. Sorry for those confusions. You always test things, but I guess you have to remember to test it. Go through the different slides as you're going through it. So anyway, um, thanks so much for um, having me here to uh, speak at the, um, uh, you know, speak at the tune-up. Um, you know, it's been, a, I guess, a year in the making as it has been for, for many people. So I'm happy to be here today and to sort of talk about, um, you know, how we sort of approach um, sort of wine research and understanding what it is that um, wine drinkers are looking for. Oh, the only problem is it's not going to show any of my animations, is it? So some of the slides aren't going to display properly. Well, we'll just have to deal with it. Okay, so just a little bit about me. I think you kind of have it if you've got sort of the bio or you looked into it. But, um, you know, I, I've been at the Vineland Research Innovation Center since uh, 2009, um, and I'm currently the director of our Consumer Insights Group. So a lot of our work experiences, um, you know, the work that we do in a group is really focused on understanding, um, you know, and defining preference drivers for different fruits and vegetables and alcoholic beverages. So I work on a wide variety of products, you know, sort of in my tenure at Vineland, I've worked on everything from like okra to peaches to apple tomatoes and um, obviously um, you know have done work on um, wine um, as well as as well as cider so my background comes from working at the um, I did my PhD at uh, Brock University um, through Covey um, looking at the impact of harvest date and crop level and ice wine so we were looking at kind of the flavor chemistry uh, of it and how that related to the sensory properties and that's where I got really interested in understanding about the consumer because somebody said to me at a conference once well what matters most what do people like better and I thought huh yeah, that's kind of the important piece of it, isn't it? So, you know, that sort of kind of led me to trying to learn more about wine and more about sort of the consumer aspects of wine um, and, and sort of wine as a beverage. So I, I did my um, sommelier certification while I was doing my PhD through um, the Canadian Association of Professional Sommeliers to sort of learn more of that kind of consumer angle and how that relates into the science and how we kind of communicate and sort of look at the different perspectives of wine, because that's one of the things that makes it so interesting. And then um, my background um, before that for my undergrad was molecular biology genetic so that kind of aligns well with you know um, working with the different breeding programs and new variety development that we do at Vineland so just a little bit about me um, and then I thought I'd give you a little bit about Vineland so not everybody um, many of you maybe are familiar with Vineland Research Innovation Center um, but if you're not um, just sort of a, a quick plug of kind of who we are to sort of put it in context so we're a private not-for-profit horticultural research center we're located um, you know in Niagara in Vineland and our mission is really about kind of improving the economic viability, sustainability, and competitiveness um, of horticulture in Canada. So anything that falls under sort of the realm of horticulture, so, you know, fruits, vegetables, flowers, trees, you know, and all the products that come from it, you know, like such as uh, such as wine, um, you know, are areas that, that we work on, um, you know, very much working through industry collaborations and um, you know, working with, our, with the stakeholders as well as private companies. We do this through sort of three main areas um, in terms of areas that we focus on. That's one of the things we've kind of realized over the kind of, I guess, 12 years now that Vineland's been around is, um, you know, that we sort of, you know, trying to focus in on things. So a lot of the projects I work in fit under this sort of first goal, which is around diversifying and enhancing horticultural products produced in Canada for both domestic and export markets. We also have a program looking at a lot of the um, automation technologies really focused on labor reduction strategies because that's such a huge component of cost in horticultural production and then also looking at the environmental performance um, so things like you know pest and um, pest and disease management um, IPM strategies biocontrol um, you know as well as you know um, plant establishment in terms of environmental performance 
So those innovation goals kind of break down into these five main programs that we have. So plant variety development focuses a lot on exactly what it sounds like, um, you know, development of new varieties. So we've got breeding programs in roses, tomatoes um, on the vine, like you see in the picture, um, as well as apples. Um, and a lot of the biochemical and molecular biological, um, you know, methods that, you know, are required for, you know, identifying um, traits that are important and, um, you know, identifying um, from both the agronomic point of view as well as from the, the consumer point of view. Um, automation, as I mentioned, is really focused on labor technologies. Um, we've got plant response in the environment, which is focused much more on kind of um, like urban greening um, and, um, you know, sort of adapting to sort of better growing conditions. Biological prop protection is pretty self-explanatory, but a lot around biocontrol, biopesticides and management, and then consumer insights, which is then um, the program that I lead. So really, what is it that we're trying to do? And, and, and it doesn't matter what product we work on, it's sort of the same kind of mindset that we use, the same approach that we take in terms of, um, you know, trying to develop, you know, kind of insights and understanding about that product category. So we take it from sort of that research component of starting since horticultural products are natural products, it's not something you can just go quickly, you know, change in the kitchen by adjusting the ingredients or, you know, just go grab another one sort of off the shelf, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And so it's about, you know, developing developing um, you know, strategies from sort of that concept design to that finished product so that we can understand um, how to product or how to position products and what the market opportunities are out on the market. So we always kind of talk about, you know, the main goal is understanding what are the preferred products and who are the people that like those products. And so there's lots of different variables that sort of come into play in this. So there's everything from those sort of intrinsic properties of it. So what is the, you know, what is the taste, the texture, the flavor? So we kind of think about like the sensory component of it. And so when you think of, you know, sort of grapes and wines, those are the varietal differences, the tannin differences, the acidity differences, you know, if you're fermented to dryness or not, you know, all of these things that come into play in, in creating those different kind of styles. But we also know that while taste is really important and is often kind of one of the first decision makers, you know, other things come into play, such as all those extrinsic, those outside kind of, you know, influers, such as the price, the region of origin, you know, um, um, like where it's grown, what its competition is, what the label looks like, you know, who's talking about it, who's recommending it, all of these types of things, how it's being marketed. And so we want to understand how all those things kind of interplay together. And we want to understand how they relate to different markets, because we know not every consumer is the same. And that there's going to be a lot of different, you know, consumer segments that are out there, understanding the size, understanding what segments we want to focus on, and understanding, you know, what are the differences in maybe kind of, you know, age, gender, you know, ethnic heritage, um, purchase behavior, habits its consumption usage, um, you know, around a product category. So people often ask us, okay, well, that's great that you do all of this, but when's the best time to do this type of research? Um, you know, when, when is it best to start thinking about understanding your product and understanding the consumer? Well, ideally, it's right from the start, you know, very early on so that you can kind of develop that right through sort of, you know, you know, the, the pipeline from, you know, product ideation all the way until you know a product's out on the market but that's not always feasible because sometimes you have a product or you want to sort of understand it during these different stages so really you know it's something that can be supported at any stage of that product development phase and it's a really good understanding you know what you want to get out of you know the type of research and about understanding your consumer so you know is it early on that you want to understand where the what the current market landscape is what are the opportunities what are the gaps where do you want to try to position you know your product in you know that segment um you know if you're thinking of it you know from um it could be from a price point category it could be from a wine style category it could be from you know trying to target a specific um you know age group or um you know buying behavior and so understanding that early on and understanding what the market looks like helps you then to be able to identify those tools that you need to move that forward it can be kind of during the development if you're making choices of how you're making the wine the different wine styles you can use a different varietal blend that you maybe have you know the impact of what you're doing on the vineyard and how that could have an impact on the profiles um um, you know, um, and liking of your product in the end. Um, and even around, you know, how you might want to position it within your portfolio or the labeling or any of those kind of elements could be, um, you know, going on during the development 
or sometimes it can be at the final stages. You know, some things sometimes happen that you just you have the product. Now you need to figure out how to get it out onto the market. And so a lot of work can be done around taking that final product that you're not really looking to change, but understanding how it positions against the competitors, what else is on the market, how you could maybe, you know, talk about it. What are its value added sort of characteristics to be able to, you know, to be able to put that forward. So these are all sort of things that we can do and, and, and apply to, um, uh, you know, understanding the consumer and, and putting new products out, um, you know, into the marketplace. So when I think about, you know, what do wine drinkers want and, you know, what is it that, what, you know, what is it that we're sort of trying to identify here? It's really understanding the consumer. And, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges that come into play. And while every, you know, every horticultural product, because I've worked on so many different ones, all has its, you know, you know, ups and downs and make, some things are easier, some things are harder. Wine has a sort of unique set of challenges that are really important that we need to be considering when we're trying to think of what the consumer wants. So I thought I'd kind of go through sort of sharing what's some of those challenges are and how we can address those with sensory consumer science to get to kind of the root of understanding you know what it really is that people are looking for. So challenge number one is that consumers often cannot describe what it is that they're experiencing. So you could give a group of consumers you know the same glass of wine and they could describe it you know as I kind of have written here on the slide in completely different ways. So one person would say I like this wine. Another person might say you know well it's not and, and this is like if I were to ask them, what do you think about this wine? So somebody would just say, you know, I like this wine. Someone would say, well, it's not very sweet. Then somebody else would say, well, it's very sour or it's not sour. No, it's bitter. Or I think it tastes fresh or I think it smells sweet and tastes fruity. So, you know, all of these things come to play. So what does this mean? They're all evaluating the same wine, but they're all having different experiences. So what are the tools that we can use and how can we kind of dive into what these different, you know, words mean to relate that to what it is that they like? So you could say make recommendations at the wine tasting bar or make recommendations, you know, in a retail setting or in a restaurant. And how do you position your wine to be giving out the proper information so that people can be talking about your wine and really kind of defining, you know, and describing? not. One of the ways we can do this is through um, 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 different panels. So what we have, um, uh, you know, at, at Vineland is we have a trained sensory panel. So these are people that are tuned into their senses. They're not your average consumer. You can give them a product, they can break it down, they can be repeatable, they can divide it up into, you know, a lexicon of, you know, different attributes to describe the nuances of those products. So differentiating it by its levels of sweetness or acidity or stringency or the amount of floral or, you know, apple or honey or any of those kind of notes in it. It's a very objective thinking of it like an instrument versus thinking of it as like a, an emotion. And we don't usually ask them about preferences. So they could go and take some of these things like, well, it's not very sweet. No, it's bitter. And then be able to taste through it and be able to say, yes, this wine, you know, is, is, has this profile by breaking it down kind of on these lexicon attributes which is different than a, a consumer panel which is very important because that's what represents the population and that's what represents who you're, you're it looks like video froze buyer is and who wants to be you know consumer holistic overall approach so you know as humans we use our eyes a lot and our, you know as our sense to, to so you know i'll see an orange i'll smell an orange and so I can say that it's an orange. But when you're looking at something like wine, you're taking that away. So all of a sudden you're smelling it and you're like, oh, I think I know the smell, but you can't place it because you haven't trained yourself to make those, you know, um, mental connections of, of linking um, th that, that sensory reaction without having those kind of visual cues. So that's something else that the trained panel can kind of tease down to be able to identify what those differences are. So for example, you know, you could give a trained panel um, this is something we call a sorting task, and you're going to miss my beautiful uh, um, animations here because it's not working, but I um, wonder if I can get it to, no, I'll just leave it. But essentially what it is, is you can have all of these wines, and then you'll taste them, and then they'll get grouped into these different um, categories. Um, I wonder if it'll show the animation if I do this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can see that, little Animation pane. There. Play. There, it's working. <laughs> um, not very pretty, but what you can see, right, is you have all the wines to start with, and then it groups them, and then you can then for each of those groupings, you can classify it based on those sensory oh. profiles. So you can take all of these different wines, and then you can be able to say that, you know, this group here, I'm just going to close this so it's not so busy. 
Let me close this. Um, so then what you can see is sort of wines can get grouped based on these different sort of sensory properties. So, you know, one group, you know, of wines is, is you know, is just considered more fruity or higher acid or another is more fruit and sort of more off dry. Another is more floral. And so then this can be correlated with what the consumer is telling you. And you can say, yes, in fact, that, you know, they're saying they like this wine and, you know, it has to do with its, you know, lower acidity or its high fruit flavors um, and some of those characteristics to kind of tease through some of those those issues to be able to relate liking because that's one thing consumers are very good at is being able to say what they like and don't like but it's figuring out why and understanding those nuances underneath um, you know where, where our research kind of really focuses and tries to help kind of you know elucidate and understand those differences. So challenge number two is around really knowledge and experience. So wine is one of those really interesting beverages because people have such vastly different kind of backgrounds, um, you know, information, experience, education that comes to, you know, using this sort of same product. And it's true about a lot of other, you know, a lot of other, um, you know, crops and products as well, but wine's a little bit unique in that there's just this big, you know, kind of divide in terms of the expert knowledge and the consumer knowledge. And so that's one of the things to kind of keep in mind when you're trying to understand the consumer and understand what the drivers are that they like, because the wine industry professional is probably viewing, is, is often viewing the wine differently from a consumer. Um, because they're thinking of it from, you know, all the knowledge that they have and all the, you know, the, the effort, the emotion, what they know about quality, what they know about, you know, fermentation kinetics, what they know about, you know, the different yeast strains that they use, what the expectation of the profiles are, and breaking it down into those details versus the consumer that's really just used drinking it and saying, you know, I like it and I don't like it. But then there's also other consumers that are very knowledgeable and, you know, very sort of into it. So um, and, and have a lot of experience and are looking at it, you know, sort of in those different ways. Um, so that's something else, you know, that really has to be aware of when you're talking about it. Um, and then as well as we see is that wine industry professionals will often view wine differently within the industry. So, um, you know, a few years ago, I was working on a project um, with the VQA and, and one of the things that came out is we had a group, a wide variety of people working on um, or tasting these same wines. And it was like a different lexicon of terms that could be used. And so basically you can almost tell what someone's like wine background was, like what profession they were working within within the wine industry based on how they described the wine and the terminology they, that they used. And so this can be very difficult too because how do we express what we're talking about um, around a product if we're all using different language? We all come up with, you know, you know, a different end conclusion in terms of understanding what it is. Because, you know, the winemaker might be really breaking it down into, you know, you know, you know, the, the bricks level, the pH, the TA, um, you know, uh, you know, what, what happened in the vineyard, what happened during the winery, you know, what's going on, whereas the Somalia might be thinking of it more holistically and in comparison to other kind of industry standards and benchmarks and, you know, previous like vintages and the wine writers trying to make it, you know, this great description to sort of get something out to the consumer. So all of this is really challenging when you're trying to understand and get down to the root of what is it that consumers are really looking for, because all of this will impact like liking choice and really how they interact with the product. So, you know, just as an example, again, you can't see kind of the animation, but the, the point comes up is that each of these labels would be considered a quality wine, depending on who you're talking to, right? Um, and depending on the context and, you know, sort of the information people have around it. But you would give this to sort of a lot of people within your group, and you would probably kind of poo-poo the wines in the top line and say, well, I don't really know if those are, I would call those quality wines, but you would be sort of in consensus, you know, about the bottom. But you give this to an average consumer, and they might think, I think the best quality wine is Baby Duck because it's consistent every single year. I always know what I'm going to get, and I can always find it. You know, so it, it all comes down to perspective. And that's one of the things that's kind of really tough to kind of keep in mind when we think about, you know, kind of challenges of understanding consumers and, and what it is that they're looking for. 
And challenge number three comes down to this kind of preference and bias. And so I lump those together because your preferences will often bias your, your, your decisions and, and, you know, vice versa. And so there's a lot of things that can come into play here. So you can think of, you know, um, brand name, pricing, familiarity, you know, region, wine style, you know, opinions of yourself, of others, like influencers, the occasion that you're going to use it. All of these things can come into play. You know, you can kind of think of it of if you're going to buy it, you know, um, a, you know, a bottle of, if you're going to go buy wine, say for your home right now, you know, during COVID, you don't have anybody coming over. Nobody's judging you. Is it the same wine you're going to buy if you're actually able to have friends over and, you know, um, you know, kind of share with them, you know, sort of what it is that you have. I don't think so. And I think, you know, even the stats that they show right now through LCBO sales and through winery sales of the massive, you know, kind of surge in, in boxed wine kind of goes to the show of, you know, people are are, are looking at occasion um, as kind of very, you know, sort of differently in terms of how they're choosing it. The same thing with brand we, and familiarity. We know, and that links into knowledge as well, is that we know consumers go with what they know and that they often go into, you know, LCBOs and into wine stores or even, you know, into your wineries and they remember the label or some detail. They don't necessarily remember the wine or the vintage or, or something else, but there's something about it that, that triggers them that they like that wine and they want to experience that wine again. Um, and it could be the same thing. It doesn't always have to be a positive. Sometimes those things can be a negative bias, um, you know, in terms of it, you know, like for, for many years, Chardonnay had sort of, you know, a bad rap um, because of uh, different wine styles in terms of how to make it. And so you get a lot of people that said, no, no, I don't, I don't drink Chardonnay. I don't like Chardonnay, but really they weren't giving it that experience because they were just thinking of one type of, of way of making Chardonnay that they didn't enjoy. So this is also, you know, a challenge that you have to think of and kind of teasing through all of the details and all of the nuances and complications that there, that there is. And part of this is we can't have any impact on this is because preference is individual. So we know that preference is innate from a very early age. If you look at the pictures on the left of the, of the babies, um, if you give a baby something that's sweet, they'll smile like the, the baby in the blue high chair is doing. Um, you give a baby something that is sour, you're going to get the reaction of, of the baby at the bottom. And they've done this with, you know, infants that are, you know, days old and the reactions are the same regardless of, um, you know, you know, ethnic heritage, um, you know, region, anything else. And it's because that's innate. Those are, you know, fight or flight kind of responses that we have of how we made food choices, like as we evolved, um, you know, as humans. So those aren't going to change. And, and those are going to be different individual levels we have within ourselves. And so somebody might like something that's really sweet, and somebody might not like something that's really sweet. And that's going to influence what wines they like and, and what they're going to choose. And we can't do anything to change that. And so even if we think a dry wine is better, it doesn't matter if they think a, a consumer thinks a sweet wine is better and it's about understanding that and being able to to to, to provide for that and, and um um you know sort of have something for, for everybody um another thing we know is that preference is very cultural so it comes from familiarity of you know growing up of what you've been exposed to what you're used to um different things like that so you know i've got sort of two examples here that you can see up at the top right one from sort of the wine world if you think of retzina wine well most people the first time they have retzina wine and some people every time after that that they have retzina wine they're not a fan of it they don't like that piney resiny note that's in the wine but in, in areas of the world, in Greece, you know, this is, you know, this is, a, you know, this is a specialty. This is something they continue to make and it's part of their culture and they enjoy it. And they don't understand why, you know, other people might not like it the way they do. And the same thing could be said if, if anybody knows, um, you know, but that's, a, um, um, you know, a durian fruit. And, you know, some people love those. They make cookies, sweets, savory, all sorts of things out of them in parts of the world. But, you know, um, to me, it just tastes horrible. And so it doesn't matter how much you say this is fantastic, you're never going to get me to, to, you know, sort of like that product. And then the other thing is environmental, which is, as I mentioned, which goes again to sort of those occasions, right? Depending who you're with, depending what you feel like, depending what the mood is, what the occasion is, all of these types of things, um, you know, may change like how how you feel about a product and, and how you interact with a product in a moment, right? So if you're with, you know, a group of friends and stuff, it might be, you know, a different way that you sort of interact and feel about a product than if you're, you know, I don't know, out with your kids and just grabbing pizza after, you know, a sports game or something like that. So that's all going to come into these kind of preferences um, and, and how that's influenced and how that's going to override, you know, any kind of, you know, sort of marketing and those types of things and, and product positioning. 
And the other thing is what that relates to is that everybody's different. And so typically we can't find one size fits all in any product. And so the best thing we can do is try to understand what the variation is out there and what those consumer segments are. So I put this up here. It's a study that we did on edible flowers, um, you know, just kind of because I think it shows a really good example. And sometimes when you sort of move outside of your, your area, you can kind of it, it, it sinks in a little bit better. But essentially what we found is we found two strong segments of consumers based on what types of flowers that they expressed a preference for um, in taste testing. So one we called the bold flavor fans, and that was about 56%, and the other were the mild flavor lovers, which was 44%. And so basically it, it came down to that profile like of the flower, it like flower itself. But what was really interesting is that both groups considered themselves to be foodies, enjoyed cooking, you know, like, you know, were influenced by friends. There was not much different about them except for that sensory of how they liked to experience these edible flowers in products. So we found the mild flavor fans, they liked edible flowers in more baked goods. So things that were more on the, on the sweeter side. And so they didn't want that strong flavor overpowering it. And that's why they prefer the flowers with the milder taste. Whereas these bold flavor fans were more um, likely to try it in savory dishes. So they liked the pepperiness or the, you know, the punch that those provided kind of to those dishes. So again, it came down to understanding how those sensory, um, you know, kind of innate preference differences impacted their liking of a product category that we wouldn't have been able to figure out otherwise wise. So going as well to sort of preference and bias, when you look at this picture, do you see a duck or a rabbit? Right? So this is where virtual presentations suck, right? Because I can't see you very much and I can't, you know, sort of do the voting and all of that stuff. But essentially, you know, you can see both and it's about perspective and it's about what people come to when, when they look at and view like a view a product. So typically when you put this image up, you know, 50% of the room sees a duck. Um, you know, there's the duck's bill right there and the eye, and then the other 50% see the rabbit, right? So there's the rabbit's nose and kind of mouth, and then those are his ears kind of facing out to the back. And so that all goes to kind of perception and that we come and we look at things from a different perspective. And so that's also going to influence how we view products um, and how we interact with, with a product. So what I thought I would do kind of for the next section of it then is just, you know, show you some studies that we've done on wine. So one's one that was completed a few years ago. I'm just taking a small piece of it out um, for, for the interest of time. And then to show you about a project that we're currently working on um, right now with um, um, with Covey um, that I think will provide some great results that maybe we could share with you at a, um, a, a spring tune up in an upcoming year. So that really goes to sort of what I was talking about um, in terms of like what's in our toolbox. So that in terms of showing those products. So I'm just going to skip through this in, in the in the kind of essence of time, just sort of watching it here. But there's a lot of different tools and approaches we can use, which is essentially what I want to say. And it's not like a one size fits all in terms of understanding the consumer. So this was um, a study that was done in 2017 um, where we wanted to understand consumer appeal to white wines um, through some liking evaluations. So we recruited consumers that were 25 to 65 years old. We had about um, 150 of them that had purchased white wine uh, or purchased wine in the last three months and had purchased at least one VQA wine out of every 10 that they had purchased. And then they didn't have to like like white wine the best, but they had to drink white wine at least once a week to be part of the study. So we were were really looking for white wine consumers. So um, the piece I'll show you here is um, we, we looked at different wine styles, sort of looking at the top Ontario wines um, um, that were grown. So we were looking at you know, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, and Pinot Grigio. And I'm just pulling out sort of the data here um, for the Pinot Grigio. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what the wines are um, just due to sort of a confidentiality, but it's sort of the concepts that I think are, are interesting that I wanted to share with you today. So in terms of this, all the wines were top selling either VQA or international wines um, that were in the $15 to $25 um, price point at the, that should say LCBO. <clears throat> And they were all sort of blind coated and in ISO glasses. So I let you know that because the influence of, you know, brand, region, all of that was not in front of the consumer. And so that often does have, you know, an impact on, on, on their choice of things. So what we did was we had a flight of eight wines. Everybody tasted through the eight wines and they rated them on a wine scale from dislike extremely to like extremely. So that we were able to gauge how much they liked each of those wines. And then they were asked a questionnaire around their wine purchase behavior, their wine consumption, their preference and then to get some demographic information to see if we could categorize consumers based on this information. 
So in terms of looking at it, what we thought was um, um, you know, interesting was that um, if we looked overall at the entire group, everybody you know said that the wines that they liked that, that that they had higher liking for that they liked the best they described them all in the same way so they described them as being kind of smooth full body sweet even though all the wines were classified as dry through the lcbo um, with floral apple pear um, and honey notes and they disliked wines were described as having either like off flavors typically because they couldn't describe what it was that they didn't like about it um, bitter and and high acidity but what's really interesting if we look at this chart here is that even, even though everybody kind of described the wines in the same way of what they liked most and liked least, when we segmented consumers based on preference, so the wines they gave the highest score to, we saw these two consumer groups that emerged. So consumer group um, one was about 40% of the population and consumer group two was 60% of the population. So even though consumers in both groups described the wines in the same way, they had very different preferences for the wines. So the wines um, in gray um, are the wines that are liked the most for that consumer group. So it was Pinot Grigio one, two, and six that were liked most by consumer group one. So what we found was actually, if you then want to look at the consumer group two, they were significantly liked less by that consumer group. So, you know, there was big differences, even though they're, they're I guess, experiencing the wines that they like in the same way, it's a different taste profile of those wines that they're liking. And so when we looked at consumer group two, we saw the same thing, whereas the most liked wines were really not well liked at all by consumer group one, even though they described them, you know, in the same way. So, you know, I, I always think this is sort of really interesting when you're kind of thinking about trying to understand consumers and, and profiles and, and everything else, because you go to consumers, you ask them what they like, they give you this information, but how is this sort of, you know, um, you know helpful in terms of, of, of defining it? Um, and so it's important then, you know, to be able to, we weren't able, we didn't do this in this study, but to be able to then go in and figure out, okay, so Pinot Grigio 1 and Pinot Grigio 3, what are their profiles? What is it that differentiates them that we could equate to those liking of that consumers are really liking or not liking? So it kind of goes to, um, we did a study on kind of on a tangent here, but on apples. And we found everybody said that their favorite thing about apples is if they were sweet um, or sweet acid balance. But what I actually found is the most important things about apples is that they have a crisp texture. And once they're nice and crisp and juicy, then, um, you know, then different aromatics come out. So, you know, there's a group of consumers that like them then when they have more of the sweet floral, um, you know, kind of fruity characteristics. And then there's another when they have more of kind of those sort of more, you know, kind of grassy vegetal, like you kind know, of green, thinking of the kind of Granny Smith apple kind of notes. So a similar type of thing is going on here. And it's going to be important to kind of, you know, dive in and understand what those differences, you know, in those profiles are. Um, so the other thing we wanted to do is kind of learn about those consumer groups and if there was anything we could really figure out to, you know, differentiate them. And um, we did see that there was differences in terms of some of the demographic information. So we found consumer group one had very little wine knowledge and consumer group two ha has said they had at least some wine knowledge. So maybe this goes to sort of, you know, like the, um, you know, education, familiarity, um, you know, more kind of complexity of wine styles between the two wine groups, which could equate for those liking. Um, and we also found that people in consumer group two tend to spend um, more on, um, you know, more on, um, like a, more on wine, like in a month. So again, it could be what types of wines they're drinking and, you know, um, the, the, you know, higher priced wines having more, um, you know, different flavor profiles, those things that are their sort of expectations in terms of what it is that they're liking the wines. But what we really found that, you know, within this study, when there are no, um, you know, when there is no other external factors, when it just tasted blind like this, it was those sensory differences. So understanding differences in sweetness, you know, um, acidity, astringency, floral, honey, fruity, um, some of those kind of notes that were um, why consumers were picking that they liked one wine over another, even though they couldn't express it very well. In the same study, we asked them, what interests you about wine? And so what we did is we took all of this information and then we put it into the Wordle app to sort of come up with this to kind of understand kind of what some of those differences are. And what we thought was really interesting is that, um, you know, some of the things that came out as the biggest was, you know, what interests them about wine is wine evaluation and sort of the diversity of, of grapes and, and the diversity of sort of the different types of wine um, that are out there. Um, there's different things around like food pairing, um, you know, feelings, it makes them feel relaxed, it's a social, um, 
um, you know, unwinding, um, you know, things around sort of origin. But it was, just, you know, interesting to see when this comes out that the, the biggest thing that they're talking about is um, you sort of grape diversity and wine evaluation, which goes to show that these consumers are sort of looking at kind of varietal names when they're going in to evaluate wine. And that's another thing in the study. They didn't know what wine variety they were looking at. <clears throat> And then just some sort of interesting wine habits um, that came out of the study is that when we looked at monthly wine expenditures, and this didn't differ based on, on consumer groups, is that 32% said they spent um, in a month between $50 and $100, which to me seems very low. My budget's much higher than that. Um, average price per bottle of wine, 45% um, said they spent between $15 and $19, which you know is, is in line with a lot of what the LCBO sales are. 47% um, um, said that they purchase of their monthly alcohol purchase, over 50% of it is spent on wine. And that 56 of those purchase wine at least once a week. And then we asked them about their VQ wine um, um, purchasing and 53% said that they, out of 10 bottles of wine, two to five would be VQA. And then when we asked them, you know, the top three reasons for selecting a white wine, um, taste, price and friends recommendation came out on top. And just um, sort of as interest as well, in terms of top grape varieties, it was Riesling, Chardonnay, and then um, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Grigio were sort of tied in terms of their top three varieties that they, they choose. So um, the next project is sort of an up and coming project um, that we've started. So this is funded by um, OGWRI, so the Ontario Grape and Wine Research Inc. Um, funded project, and it's in collaboration with Debbie Ingalls and Jim Wilworth at Brock University. And Jennifer Kelly is the postdoc that's um, working between Brock and Vineland um, on this project. And so what we're looking at is it's a focus on 100% um, Ontario wines from Vidal and Marquette. So we're looking at quality improvements and getting a better understanding of consumer preference of these wines as, um, as table wines. So there is a focus on this of wines that are in that um, kind of kind of competitive sort of ten to twelve dollar price range in terms of looking at um, you know Ontario options in those sort of lower price points. Um, and the end date for this project is this fall. But I brought it up because I just thought it's sort of nice to know what work is up and coming and what's sort of happening sort of in this space so people are aware of it and kind of stay tuned. Um, and, and we'll be happy to talk to you more about it um, as we have results. But I can share with you the main objectives of it, which is the impact of viticultural and um, you know, winemaking practices. Um, such as crop level, bricks at harvest, and yeast strain on wine sensory profiles and consumer acceptance of the Dial table wines. And then with Marquette, um, it's consumer acceptance of some Marquette table wines since that's sort of a, a new sort of hybrid variety that's being planted sort of throughout Ontario, but we don't have a lot of information about what people what people think about it. And with Vidal, we chose um, that was chosen because it's considered mostly as an ice wine grape, um, but you know there is opportunity for um, creating sort of high quality table wines out of it as well um, and, and then as well as the, the opportunity of creating you know high quality in that um, well I guess high quality light low price point is I guess sort of what we're looking at here. So I just thought I'd show you kind of for Vidal the experimental design so what it is that we're, we're looking at. So we have a, a low crop 18 bricks um, um, treatment, a high crop 18 bricks treatment and then a low crop 22 bricks um, and a high crop 22 bricks treatment. And then each of those have been fermented separately um, with three different yeast strains. So IOC, B thiols, uh, Sovi, and QA23. So that was in 2019, that's sort of the full design. And then in 2020, we repeated it um, with just the, um, the high crop treatments, um, the 18 bricks and the 22 bricks, um, just to have, um, we, to be totally honest, we didn't have the budget for both years, but we wanted to kind of get two years of data for sort of one of those treatments. Um, and then those different sort of yeast strains that are in there. So all those wines are made, they've all been, you know, sort of bottled, um, they've been sort of, they've been analyzed and we're looking at the volatile profiles of it. We just completed the, the sensory work on the Vidal. Unfortunately, we've had a lot of project delays because of COVID as everybody has and our inability to complete in-person consumer testing. But we're currently um, sourcing commercial Vidal and Marquette wines for the study. So you may hear 
from me or somebody on my team as we reach out. Um, um, I'm looking to purchase some uh, market wines to participate in the study. And then we're looking at doing the consumer acceptance work this summer because I'm really positive that uh, things will open up as um, you know people get more vaccinations and we can get uh, this sort of all under control. Um, and so we're looking at about 150 consumers that will be evaluating the Vidal and Marquette wines. And so we'll be able to tell you sort of more information about what consumers are looking for um, for those two wine styles. So that's my presentation for today. Um, I hope I didn't go too over time. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see people because right now I'm just talking to my. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hello. Hello. Go. Did we lose her? I'm here. Okay. 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 Cool. Hey. Okay. Well, <laughs> just uh, the the screen froze for a bit. Uh, but uh, thank you, Amy. That was uh, thank you for an insightful. Uh, I mean very detailed and uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, I was gonna ask if anybody has a question for Amy. Um, regarding i have one yes please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead sure um actually i have like a million but i'll just pick one because this was really interesting um, sorry yeah it is yes <laughs> um amy do you ever like repeat your experiments with the same wines and the same consumer panel just to see you know if they rate the wines similarly and i guess i'm asking because we are like with wineries we kind of have a unique situation in that we need to have our consumer enjoy the wine at the tasting bar and then enjoy it again at home right so just wondering if you've done any experiments kind of like that or if you have any insight into that yeah so we have um in in some the one i talked about today we, we didn't um but i have in the past where we've replicated like one or two of the wines um within the study so the consumers don't know they're seeing the same wine like a couple of times to see if they are repeatable in being able to make that evaluation and we've done that in in lots of other um, um projects as well to be able to look at that and what we find is if you know just if you're on the question of liking Yes, they tend to be quite repeatable um, in terms of, um, well, the majority of consumers, let me clarify, the majority of consumers do seem are quite repeatable in, in, in that rating and that they'll give it a, a similar rating, you know, the first time they see it um, and the next time they see it. But there are always like, you know, so many factors that come into play that could, you know, sort of impact it. Um, and, you know, sometimes even, you know, typically when we're trying to give a flight of wine to consumers, we're trying to keep it within a similar sort of style. So if there's going to be some really sweet wines and some, you know, really dry wines, we'll probably going to separate those out into two different flights because if you mix all of those up you're going to have these uh, presentation effects that are going to influence you know the, the sensory properties and the liking because you know there's all those sort of interactions with those taste components so you have to be careful of all of like uh, of those types of things um, um with it but yeah like we do we do try to set those things up i think one of the things too you know that there's been you know even sort of research that shows how people perceive wine differently i think it was done in australia in the tasting room versus how they perceive it at home and a lot of that has to do with when i talk about kind of that sort of preference and bias and the occasion and so what it has to do is other factors are coming in you're at a tasting bar you're with your friends you're having a great time they're talking to you about the wine they're telling you what you should taste in the wine you know um, they're giving it to you in the right order like all the conditions are sort of perfect in the tasting bar to really appreciate that wine but then you go home and you open it up and you eat it with something it doesn't go it doesn't match well with or it's not at the right temperature or you just had a chocolate bar and then you're taking your sip of wine or something like that you know it could be like influencing how it's perceived and that's one of the frustrations right is we have no control over it once it kind of leaves the winery and then it goes in their hands and how they do it and so that's just sort of your you know you could you know sort of you know sort of talking to, to the consumers and telling them you know the best ways of, of eating it or enjoying it or, or those types of things but a little bit of it unfortunately is out of our control that's really interesting and um do you think that like branding could play a really big role in kind of like keeping them um like enjoy 
allowing them to enjoy it at home? Like would branding play a big role in that, do you think? It can, yes, from the standpoint of we know that people, you know, use their eyes to remember um, label or there's specific, you know, kind of characteristic or there's something on, on the label that makes people sort of, you know, remember it and remember that really positive experience they had when they purchased it, they're going to, you know, that's going to kind of carry over to when they grab it out of their cellar or their, the box or wherever they keep their wine at home, right? And then be able to look at it. And I think, you know, that's part of the reason why there's been these crazes for certain types of wines. They never usually have very generic labors. Like if you think of, you know, the few years ago when we talked about the critter wines, it's because people could remember that. They could remember and go into, you know, you know, go into the, the, the liquor store and ask for it, not by name, because they typically don't remember that, but they could ask for it by, you know, the one with the, the penguin on it, you know, like sort of type of thing. So yeah, you can definitely kind of make your product stand out and, you know, make it make it unique so that consumers are more likely to remember it um, and, and attach it with those positive connections. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I was wondering, uh, when you do uh, your tastings, you, you for example, for a do you do it by type of wines or do you do you because do you, you did it all you know visual so what was the driver um like were you so, asked or yeah so every study it's going to be a little bit different it's going to depend on the questions you were asking in this one because they were they were interested in different product categories like different wine profiles and so that's why we did it by variety but you can just as easily do it by like by style so you could say i want you know dry white wines that are you know at the you know that are produced and they could be a wide variety you know so you could have in there i don't know you you know i'm just trying to sort of think of it off of the top of my head but say you were looking at a whole flight of more kind of like savory wines so you could have in there you know like maybe a Pinot Grigio, or you could put in a Gruner, or you could put in a Sauvignon Blanc, you could put in like Alberino, or you know something like that. But the biggest thing that's going to matter to consumers, sweetness just throws them off, right? So we did one study on Rieslings, um, like many years ago, and they said, oh no, the the the, the people like, don't worry about the sugar level, it, like it won't matter. The wines by consumers segmented by sugar content. We could we could look we could look at like the sugar concentration and see liking. And so the sweeter the wines, the higher liking, you know, higher liking was for the majority. There was also, um, you know, not everybody, but those are things that are going to be important. So when you're doing consumer work, if you're trying to kind of remove the influence and all those sort of other biases and really understand that the, the, the taste properties that are important, it's really important that the wines are like, are, they don't have to be the same varietal, but they have to be the same style category. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about the wines that we would produce. Uh, we produce in the the county. They can't not be sweet, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, uh I don't know <laughs> how we well, could. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, just I, yeah. So yeah. that's just something you have to be careful of. Okay? If you're going out to the majority of consumers, sweetness yeah. is going to matter. Just look at the top selling wines at the LCBO and and red or white and that's going to be there but that doesn't mean everybody loves sweet wines and that doesn't mean consumers think they like sweet wines but so that's what i'm just saying is you just need to be careful because you don't want to put your county wines out with the top selling chardonnay from you know california that's a totally different style right that's going to just throw things off and you're not going to be able to kind of see things um you know sort of see things well um so it, you know that's where it's important to kind of think about the characteristics you know of the wines it's and then also what influence we've also done tastings where we've given them the labels we've given them the information and asked them you know to see the influence of of labels bottles regions you know information on 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 what they expect to like and what they actually like amy does that apply to sort of uh, the opposite like high acid wines as well even if the consumer doesn't know exactly what high acid is or what acid is in wine in terms of their perception of that, like high, low and whether they like it or not? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I would say for sure. And I, I just use sweetness as an example, but you could really use kind of, you know, you know, other characteristics as well. Um, often when people, often we've found when consumers talk about a wine being really sour, 
they're actually talking about other things. It's not actually the acidity, you know, that they're referring to. And, you know, as you all know so well, is wine, it's so much about the balance. So you can't just look at the, the, you can't just look at the concentration. Like you can't just look at the values of the sugar and the acid and the pH and be able to say it's going to be this or that because there's so much more at play that's going to give you that, that balance, that profile, you know, of kind of what's going on in there. So, you know, um, you know, definitely if there's a, you know, a, a sweet wine and acidic wine and a bitter wine, you're probably going to get people kind of describing it in all different ways because they don't have that familiarity and that expertise that the winemakers have of being able to put a label on, on each of those different things. And so they just, they typically think of sweet being positive, sour being negative. And so that's the where, how they then communicate it because they don't have a better way of communicating it. Does, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. I yeah. have a... I have a follow up to Carly's question um, as well, which I think is is really good and really important because as as we look to serve market wine um, online and more visually and with sort of the Instagramming of of everything, does the label become more important? Does as Carly mentioned the experience of like being in Pr Prince Edward County and bring, uh, being in the tasting room? and tasting it um, become more important or the, the brand of the, of the winery um, become sort of more of a factor in terms of sort of either purchasing decisions based on lifestyle or actual quality and product? Yeah, that's a complicated, complicated question, right? Uh, complicated sort of, there's a lot of different variables at play there, right? So, you know, you can definitely through having consumers come in, have a positive experience, creating a connection, being able to see that wine, you know, at their local store or being able to order it from you online and bring it home and continue to have that positive experience where you build that brand loyalty and you'll, you know, get those sort of repeat, you know, sort of purchases. Cause that's another thing that's changed a lot is, is, is online sales for a lot of products that weren't online before, um, you know, just out of survival mode, but then also realizing that it's a huge opportunity, you know, when you can make it work of, of connecting with your consumers. Um, but it's harder to make those connections the first time around because people are going to be nervous to say, order a case of wine if they've never tried it before, or they've never had that winery before because they're worried if they're, if they're going, you know, you know, to like it, um, you know, or, or not to like it. So, you know, there, there's, there's sort of, I guess it comes down to a lot of it is you can get people to buy things once based on the package, but if it doesn't, what's inside the package doesn't meet those liking characteristics that they like, it doesn't matter how beautiful they think that bottle is, they're not going to buy it again if they didn't enjoy drinking it, right? So the perfect is when you can get the two things to match up. So you've created a memorable experience, you've created a brand or, you know, a, a label, a bottle that they remember, that they're able to get access to. He's frozen again. <laughs> I think it's just buffering and she'll be back. Yeah, yeah. But it's so interesting. Uh -oh. Oh, she turned. Okay. Probably I talk too much. They kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, we're, we're... Anyway, sorry. I don't know what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know I mean, what, what you heard last, but you know, I, uh, I think once you've created that familiarity and that brand loyalty, then people yeah. will be willing to try other products that they maybe haven't tried before because they like they like it. You've, you've created that kind of connection with them. Whereas they might not go to a new winery they've never heard before and, and order wines that they've never tried before because they don't know whether they're gonna have that kind of familiarity. So I don't know if I kind of pieced it together between getting kicked out of the meeting and coming back, but I, but I hope that kind of helps to answer your question. Yeah, and I think that's it. I mean, that's obviously been the challenge over the last year uh, where we've seen a great uptick in online buying of wine and cider, which is still relatively new. Um, but yes, how do you convince a consumer to spend X numbers of dollars to buy six, 12, 
what have you, uh, of an item that they've either tried once or have never tried, you know, if they haven't been here. Um, it's not just like a widget uh, yeah. that they, yeah. they'll just order off Amazon. It's a very different buying proposition for consumers. Yeah. So, you know, um, I like, I think what some like wineries have been doing, um, you know, that's worked well is, you know, having those variety packs. So people aren't committed to six bottles of like the same wine or something. Right. And then they're showing a diversity of their portfolio. So, and different price points and such, and you get it for like, you know, a lump sum. Um, and so then people can, you know, maybe get experience to some of those different things. I think, you know, the other thing we've seen, you know, um, through things I've read and, and, you know, sort of people I've talked to and such is that the, also the increase in like wine subscriptions to some of those wine club memberships. So that could be another place is working with those to get your wines into those because um, you know, what um, uh, you know, some people have found is that they were part of sort of one of these kind of wine clubs that sort of ships all over. And then people really liked the wine that was in their box. And so then they contact the winery and then, you know, kind of build, you know, kind of loyalty that way. So it's a lot, it's a lot of, unfortunately kind of, you know, there's, there's no kind of silver bullet solution. It's a lot of kind of legwork and hard work to kind of build that, especially when you can't get people coming in. Um, and so, um, you know, kind of clever ways. Another thing, I haven't seen it in Ontario, but um, my uh, I have family in Nova Scotia, and they said what they were doing there was wineries were getting together and offering like a, a region pack that they were sending out um, so that, you know, people could get a sampling of wines from sort of some of the different wineries. And then again, it can help to build that loyalty because if you pick the ones you like the best from that, then you'll probably reach out to that winery specifically the next time. So that could be another way of thinking about it is thinking of it from a, a community approach of how to reach your consumers. Since usually when they're coming to the area, they're not coming to just one winery, right? They're sort of traveling around and they're getting recommendations from one place to go to the next place. That's great. We're going to be doing exactly that. And I'm actually speaking to wines of Nova Scotia next week. So. Well, then you want to be reliable too, right? Uh, once you've built, yeah, you want to. Yeah, yeah, you have to put out a consistent high quality product yeah. that it meets yeah. the expectations, right? Yeah. So. You can't be, you know, you can't have a wine and then one time you put it out and it's kind of, you know, dry and, and more austere. And then the next time you put it out and it's sweet and fruity, but it's got the same label and the same packaging. And you just say it's vintage variation because consumers don't understand that. And so now they're like, well, I just don't like that one. And then they won't go back to it. So that that's yeah. another piece of building that loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. So does anybody else have any comments, questions? For Amy, you can put your question in the chat if you'd like as well. Okay, so thank you, Amy, for uh, I mean, um, uh, all your efforts putting this uh, presentation together. Uh, you got uh, hopefully uh, everybody got a little bit of. Uh, uh, direction on how they can plan and um, uh, their um, their uh, marketing strategy, I guess. And uh, thank you uh, for everyone for attending the seminar uh, series. Uh, you, the the exhibit is still open. Um, for uh, just to let you know that uh, all the presentations are being recorded. So for anybody, I mean, if you want to get go back to your uh, oh, Thank you for um, if you want to go back to any of the presentations, uh, I think that uh, we will put uh, something uh, together. Uh, um, it will be either on the on the, the Pequa channel uh, on YouTube uh, or uh, right work. Yes. And then uh, also like um, if anybody wants to go back to come back, uh, anything will be available in terms of uh, and everything for uh, another six months. So if you just log in, then you can um, contact anybody who's uh, in the booth. Okay. Yeah, all so, the documents, uh, all the yes. documents, PDFs, yeah. presentations will be available. Still in. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. So thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully, see you next year. If you have any uh, suggestions, um, just uh, put them up 
uh, in the ch in Oh, we lost her. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Okay, thanks. Bye.